Welcome to the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. I'm your host, Guru Nishan, and I was born and raised in this community. The people of our community matter to me. And so I started this podcast with several intentions in mind that are organic and always changing. Um, number one, to break the veil of silence that is long permeated and continues to strangle the 3HO community, Kundalini Yoga community in the name of neutrality. Number two, to validate and help clarify the complex feelings of those who have joined this lifestyle, were born and raised into it, and or who have practiced or taught Kundalini Yoga. Number three, to encourage active listening to uncomfortable conversations from our community as a revolutionary act of self and collective healing. Number four, to let survivors know that we see them, we believe them, we love them, and we will fight for their truth to be addressed. Number five, to let teachers who are denying, gaslighting, or spiritually bypassing know that what they are doing is willfully ignorant and re-traumatizing victims. Number six, to illuminate the inherent racism, homophobia, cultural appropriation, and exploitation that perpetuates the teachings, 3HO lifestyle, and the overall community ethos. Number seven, to stop the perpetuation of gaslighting and victim shaming by naming it for what it is. Number eight, to dismantle internalized shame, guilt, toxic positivity, and light washing mentality. Number nine, to honor all of the parts of ourselves that have been forgotten or silenced. Number 10, to honor each and every body that has come through our community, both named and unnamed. Number 11, to encourage people to do their own research, process their own emotions, get somatic therapy and other therapy and support as needed, draw your own conclusions, and be critical thinkers rather than just blindly follow anyone. Your story matters. Please share it when you're ready. We're here to listen and to support you. I want to thank all of our listeners who have been sharing, listening, and reviewing the podcast. Thank you for all of the donations that have been received in support of this broadcast. If you would like to offer support, you can donate a one-time or monthly donation at gurunishan.com slash uncomfortable conversations. Most importantly, share this broadcast with a friend. Today, I want to welcome our guest, and her name is Olivia Taglioli, originally born in Italy and lived there until 1998. At the age of six years old, her mom announced that Olivia was to receive her spiritual name, Atmakar, from Yogi Bhajan, who she met at the summer of 1985 in Spain. From then on, under her mom's guidance and sometimes insistence, she began practicing Kundalini Yoga and later Satnam Rasayan and other 3HO lifestyle practices. She met Guru Dev Singh in 1990 at age 11 and attended her first European yoga festival in Loche, France in 1992 at age 13. That was also the first time that she did white tantric yoga. She was counseled by Guru Dev Singh and was regularly, regularly sexually abused by Guru Dev Singh at the age of 16, 17. And she was forced to keep quiet by her mom, Guru Dev Singh, and the overall community ethos. At the age of 19, 1998, she was moved 
to the Amsterdam ashram, working for the ashram, the 3HO Foundation, and the Yogi Tea Company in Europe for several years in numerous various capacities. In 1999, she married a former MPA student from San Diego, California, whose parents are well-known members in 3HO. Their wedding was officiated by Guru Dev Singh at Solstice 1999. They had three daughters together and later divorced in 2010. She currently resides in San Diego, California with her four daughters. She's a massage and craniosacral therapist part-time, a writer, and a self-healer. I want to welcome you, Olivia. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's a pleasure. I'm uh, happy to be here. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Yes. Yeah. Tell me, so, yeah. Tell me why. Why is it important for you to share your story now? Yes. It is very important for me to share this story today so I can uh, honor my 16 and 17 year old self that did not receive the, the proper recognition at that time. Um, there should have been certain action taken um, back then. And since it didn't happen, I'm making them happen right now. It's important for me to do this for myself, for my beautiful daughters, and <laughs> for my mom, and generally for my, my whole lineage, mostly the female lineage, but my whole lineage. Feeling that in my bones. Mm -hmm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes, it is important to to make sure that you know, like I was telling you before, things are put in order, so we can come full circle around things that have happened that have not been acknowledged. So, so I'll, I, yeah, I just want to start here to say so that listeners know that when I read your story, um, when you sent me the bio after you had called and we had spoken, I really only put it together in terms of the sequence and really seeing the complexity here. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know the full story in terms of um, beyond the abuse. I didn't know what happened into your adult life, so to speak. So um, I'm quite literally rattled inside by the formula and patterns that are already illuminated just by reading mm -hmm. your bio out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just want to, yeah, thank you for acknowledging that. And also bring a little, I had a vision while I was putting my daughter to sleep just moments ago, which was that of a, of a tree. I, I saw how the events that occurred in my life are, are not going to be overcome other than in terms of growth, like much like a tree does, you know, if you, if you go and section a tree, it has all its rings and it tells, and those tell all the stories that the tree has undergone. And it's not an overcoming, it's an undergoing in, in this moment. This is how it feels, right? Yeah. It's like, I hold my whole story as a tree that grows beyond those rings and understands from them. Mm. So a tree doesn't grow regularly, you know, it grows in the ways in which those events like if it's a storm or if it's uh um who knows a fungus that attaches to it it creates a bubble or you know and then it branches out so i'm just gonna hold on to to that image for myself as i bring this story because right now i know that i have been with myself enough times with my whole little self here and there throughout my past and and uh i know that 
we're all one. I know that many, many times I have it, during self healing sessions, I've gone to meet myself back in the past and patted myself saying, we're going to be okay because I was in a safe space then, right? I was, you know, laying perhaps in my living room uh, on a comfy mat with comfortable cushions and, and an incense on, whatever it was that needed to be there to make me feel safe and, and ready to go and meet those parts of myself that had been injured mm. severely yes. and damaged. And silenced. And silenced. Yes, yes, yes. That's a feeling that I've had often that of, yeah. Well, when the culture itself creates an atmosphere that silence is what you have to grow into, you're giving such a beautiful analogy of a tree that continues to grow and grow magnificently because that's what trees do, but yeah. it doesn't discount the abuse that was silenced yeah. and the resilience that that tree had to express. And you're speaking to that and that your story represents that resilience yeah. and that, that the healing, a part of it is speaking to it even years late, like you did this, you spoke to these parts of you. Yes. Now you get to bring your, not only your process, more of your whole self, but you get to go revisit that time in a way that says this was not okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, if uh, the, the tree had the ability to, that tree would take a, a nice walnut of, of whatever pain that experience and toss it at the forehead of the people that were responsible for it that would be i would uh, i would probably be okay with that i would enjoy just a little bit of a uh, you know relief but you know we're not doing that today it's just you know metaphorically because <laughs> you know oh my gosh it, yeah i don't know to be honest but i want you to give us the lens into this because I'm quite literally astounded and not simultaneously like yeah. there it is. So yes, yes, yes. Um, being that you're speaking in Europe, you're speaking of the European Yoga Festival. You know, the, I really want us to go back because there's just so many points I want to make. But I want you to to start where you'd like to start. In yes, yes, I would like to start uh, by saying that uh, the, the, this uh, these experiences that I am going to share. Uh, were not all of uh, my own making. So I'm in this conversation calling upon either the consciousnesses or, or unconsciousnesses, subconsciouses of the people that were also participating in those moments. Yeah. And uh, let's, let's start by, by saying that, yes, uh, I did feel caught a little bit in the net of uh, the 3HO lifestyle Kundalini yoga community because my mom made those choices. There was never a time where I was asked if I was in agreement with, uh, with her choices. I was required to go along. And so I did. As you um, read through the introduction, those are the events that took place. The main one that definitely was a, a fulcrum point in my growing up was when I got abused, when the abuse by Gurudev began. And that was uh, in the summer of 1996, uh, almost exactly a year after my stepdad also took advantage of a situation to try and abuse me, which I was able to deflect, uh, even though I was totally under the influence because he had given me some mushrooms to have an experience together. And I backed completely off when he made his advantage advances. Um, Gurudev was aware of this, but somehow thought it'd be a good idea that on that day, yes. Pause. Guru Dave yes. was aware of this because he was close with your mom. Is that correct? So that is, can you that is context, correct. can you back up a little bit? Because I really want you to frame how you ended up knowing Guru Dave Singh through the lens of your mom's involvement. So just tell us, like, what was it like for your mom to start making these choices? 
and mm-hmm. suddenly you have a new name and you go to yoga fest like was this was this fun for you or was it just weird there were parts where I was enjoying and parts where I completely felt awkward and uh, foreign. It did not resonate with me. Um, the, the, the way I was growing up in Italy was very different from these new uh, practices and, and beliefs that she was um, exposing me to. And, and, and describe your me mom's to involvement for us. Yes, yes. Uh, so she certainly was believing that these were true healthy ways of being and you know being my caretaker i feel you know naturally she wanted me to have a similar experience to benefit from them so meaning kundalini yoga is healthy being a vegetarian is healthy um changing your name for the spiritual name, not cutting your hair. Was that a part of it too? Was covering All of those hair? ones, yes, were part of it, except for the name. You know, I was not uh, forced to um, to be called Atma Car. I, you know, I held it there as a, actually, I, when I was little, I enjoyed having received a, a spiritual name. And do you remember that when you met Yogi Bhajan? Uh, it was actually my mom that met him, not me. He, yeah. um, um, I just, you know, absorbed from her the experience. She definitely had, was excited about that because after that, it was, you know, progressively more and more a, um, adopting and becoming uh, those teachings that he was sharing, you know, and uh I don't, I don't want to, you know, judge her for it. I think that that's uh, what she needed to do in her own path to understand certain things, certain things. And yes. But just for context, so she's getting all the teachings because you're her children. These are just the things that are happening, but she's close to Guru Dave Singh. She's like in his inner circle, serving him, learning, and is already from her story, right, is already, um, quote, being abused in a sexual relationship that she didn't even consider. Now, this is this is what we know now because she read her story. What yeah. I'm wanting to context for the readers is the reason Guru Dave Singh knew anything about Olivia is because her mom was disclosing this with the intimacy of the counseling relationship that she yes, had with true. him. I also was one to share with him what had happened with my stepdad. I, he, I was one of his um, regular patients, you know? I would go um, almost every, every month when he would come to my city, I would go and see him. He had become part of our uh, reoccurring routine reality, you know? Um, okay. I began... Uh, studying under him and and we would go you know all in a group uh, to a restaurant after class and uh, I began to notice how somehow my mom and I were privileged under his wing because we never had to pay and um, I don't think at some point he, he stopped accepting payments even for for my treatment so some um, boundaries there were were being dissolved, and in a way, it at that time it made us it made me feel more comfortable in uh, under his guidance or under his um, you know leadership. I was young, and those are forming years. My um, father figure was a very conflictual one I definitely was seeking for something stable and that's where the hole was that he was able to fit into my stepdad obviously got out of the picture at some point when he tried to he tried tried to kiss me on one night and that also made that space even more available for someone to to try and put stability in my very damaged, unstable self. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, I am, as I speak, I'm realizing right now that those were nice elements to, you know, 
um, to put in act what I call a reach and grab type of um, quality in in how well it's a, a dynamic that can take place you know reach and grab it's like instead of asking for permission you just go and take wherever you feel and I was definitely a I had all the elements for that type of formula to to occur well and because there was the nature of a connection and relationship with your mom's level with him and you he had privied information about you and then he was able to use that to be able to then bring you in and absolutely and what was it like to go from like this counseling energy mm -hmm. to when it became abuse can you help us know that yeah it it was uh, above all very very confusing i felt um, immediately uh well on the day of the first abuse very much frozen i was not understanding what was happening uh even though he was he was explaining me these contradictory contradictory uh ideas as he was you know touching my body all over during a treatment so it was a healing session and during which he began to to touch me how informal can I go there he was like fondling my right breast and I was like what's happening right now I was completely you know on a the free stage in certain uh harm harmful situation we can go into fight flight or freeze and freeze was the one for that one occasion and he would explain as as he would do that that you know energetically whatever place he was touching would uh, have you know an opening on my neck or you know it would release uh, some other something somewhere else it was basically well yeah. he, what i call it was brain framing me mm. i i was in shock i did not know what to do and and that was it, that's what was happening while I was still in shock, he also proceeded to let me know things like uh, you and I have known each other for lifetimes and uh, I remember you and meeting you under the wisdom tree. Some, some I don't know, <laughs> under the wisdom tree. And uh, finally, we've seen each other. We have met each other in this lifetime. And it's like the wisdom tree once again. And uh, there's no, you know, age is not important under those circumstances. So you and I are finally back together. And um, we can continue to do our work. And I'm, I'm just, you know, there in shock, listening to this dude that I thought was some sort of parental guidance, someone I completely trusted with everything I believed, knew the truth. And I'm like, is this, is this, is this true? Cause I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even read my own feelings at that time. I wanted at some moments to kind of leave but he had pinned me down and he started to in, instill this programming. He said that he rec recognized me the very first time he saw me on the sadhana field at the yoga festival. That's uh, the first time I was there. I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered, oh, he started grooming me since back then because, you know, Every time I would meet him at the classes, every time uh, that there would be, you know, little moments, he would always, you know, call me, oh, princesa, oh, linda, oh. And he knew what kind of story I was coming from. I was very, you know, my, my self-image, uh, self-concept was very low. I didn't have a father figure to, you know, protect me, to nourish me, to guide me. 
he knew that he could do almost whatever he wanted. Um, I remember walking into his classes and before all of his students, he would just pay extra attention to me and, and make me feel good, which felt good because I always felt like shit. I felt that I was unheard, that I didn't really matter, that whatever I would speak was not really heard or valued. And he, there he is, a person that is validating me in whatever way he did. And then, so, so those were years where I built up such a, a trust in this, in this person. And I, during that long length of shock time on that day, I wasn't really sure what to do with the information that was being given to me by him. I absorbed it. Um, also, he made sure to tell me something that just messed me up completely. He said, we have been lovers for, um, for many lifetimes. You and I cannot be lovers in this lifetime because it's not allowed. So he already starts like messing with things. However, he put his hands all over my body, he kissed me and things like that. And then he also told me that this had to remain completely secret, completely secret, because I was the only one, because I was special, somewhat chosen, blah, 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 blah. And that if I told anyone, he would tell me that I, he would tell everyone that I was crazy. So basically, I, I was choked right here. He put a huge framing in my head. I don't like using brainwashing. It'd be nice if it was washing, but no, it was a frame. And, and there I was having to deal with such a, a, um, it was such a magnitude of a situation with, you know, my 17 year old really shitty tools to deal with it. What am I going to do? This man is a married person. He has children. He sees tons of people. I, you know, I'm a 17 year old kid and somehow this person is telling me all these things. What am I going to do? So I left. I was confused. I remained confused. I kind of, for the initial time, I went along with his leading with his leadership you know okay fine we will see each other and he will he will he was putting it under the 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 fake name of healing you know he said that we were healing something that we were healing my situation so he keep he kept framing it that you would keep having healing sessions with him at, even after this time when he kind of did this whole brain frame and then it, it violated yeah. you he continued, he said, you will continue to come have a healing sessions. And was everyone sexual? It, point? Yes. I mean, it was, it was, so it was more, uh, more confused than that. It wasn't, he did, he did frame it as healing. And then it would, he would proceed to let it go beyond what I feel healing should be looking like. It was always, I remember that, you know, like intercourse, intercourse probably happened twice over the period of a year because he always kept it, you know, like he had, he held it back. I don't even know why, just maybe to, to keep things. I have no idea what his motives were other than the fact that, you know, there was for sure plenty of, uh, um, of four what I would call foreplay. So that just would, for clarity, yeah. he would fondle you. Would he be naked himself? Yeah, sometimes. And, yes, so that he, he would be naked. And he would have intercourse with you sometimes. He but had. it was kind of like he was, quote, trying to hold himself back from that finale, but he was doing almost anything else. He was definitely doing every anything else. Uh, um, he would always have some sort of like... Um, um, he would stage a situation. He would always use the elements to protect our space um, or, or, you know, 
whatever he thought would protect our space and then things would happen we slept well, together he's framing several it times. Is in healing so he's using healing language to frame an atmosphere that then allowed him to do whatever he did yes that's correct okay. so keep that going. more than that it, it just confused the shit out of me because you know i you know i was following his lead thinking that he knew that he was you know somehow seeing a bigger picture than i did until until i started to question things you know and i remember vividly one time uh i i just directly asked him look man you are every weekend in a different town are you really truly saying to me that i'm the only one cuz I mean, the question popped in my head several times. And the way he answered me was with a question was like, do you really believe me to be that person? And obviously I was like, oh, well, no, of course not. And then what does he do? Like second moments later, he just puts me on his knees, pulls down my pants and, and starts spanking me, telling me that he is, uh, what did he say? Oh, he was resetting my nervous system. I was just so humiliated. I, from then on, the the question marks kept like avalanching in my head. I was just, what is going on with this human being? So <sighs> I'm disgusted. I know. I, that's what I'm left resetting with. Resetting your nervous system. What? Yeah. First of all, gaslighting 101. Right, think, right. What do you mean? You think I might be the person that does that? Yeah. That's gaslighting. It's answering a question with that with a question to make yeah. the other person feel like they're crazy. Yeah. And then you said the next thing you know, he puts you on his lap, pulls your pants down, and spanks you. Yeah. I know. I mean <laughs> Disgust is uh, oh. all that I'm left with from that experience. It's like, Jesus Christ. <sighs> okay. And so I, I start, um, you know, putting some questions out there too with my mom. You know, I'm like, Mom, uh, do you think that Guru Dev is loyal to his wife? Because I was feeling really shitty about, you know, so he continued to make me believe that I was the only one. At times, you you know, we would be on phone calls and he would tell me that he was completely obsessed and in love with me. That sometimes at some point soon, he would take me uh, and we would run away somewhere in Asia to live together. And I was, I mean, I didn't know what to think of those things. But then- You're, you're could, 16, 17 at this point. You're 17. Yes, I was, I was 17. And the abuse had been going on these healing sessions were this so the just to be correct for at least a year for for the time frame I want to be you know chronologically correct it started when I was 17 I was um, the summer it, the summer of 1996 I was already 17 okay. this took place for about a year and and basically we would see each other every month when we would come to town there would be a healing session and then there would be other meetings that were just completely private where I would go to the yoga center where he taught um, or not the yoga center where he taught. It was uh, an apartment that used to be a yoga center where my mom worked and they belonged to Narayan Kar, who is his uh, assistant in Rome and was a friend of the fam our family for many years before we met Gurudev and um, she would let him use the space when he would come to town so he would invite me there and sometimes we would sleep together and sometimes i would give excuses to my mom letting her know that i was going out with my friends but really i was spending time with him and um other times like my mom describes in her story i would uh, leave two hours earlier before school so i could you know go and bring in breakfast and um it you know the, oh. those were the the times in which we would regularly meet then there have been other special occasions which were one time we went to um it was shortly after that first abuse that he 
asked me to go with him to New Mexico and Mexico after yoga festival um, in 1996. And that's what I did. I went with him. He kind of, you know, took me to Española and dropped me off there while he went and did other stuff. In New Mexico, a bunch of other, you know, sexual encounters did take place always. Not all of them under the umbrella of healing sessions at this point. That He kind of, you know, I remember a car ride one one morning at dawn where he stopped on the side of the road and I don't know what started to touch me all over the place um I remember a night at a hotel in Albuquerque and that's uh where again there was that one uh I don't I don't know what he was doing it was just you know playing his game but you know we we were all completely naked there was a lot of foreplay and a lot of that but we could not have sex and we were not lovers you know it's just like such a com- you know contradictory contradicting conflictual uh mm. Mm, if, you know events slash uh, per- the perception was completely distorted which i feel is what he continuously reinforced a distortion yes. you know a, a, a perversion it's yes. that quality of the state of being that somehow he was cultivating and feeding and I was involved in it and allowed him to and it was early on at the, you know on the onset of the story so I wasn't having all the doubts yet and then um, well and you're talking about a relationship that was formed from the time that you came into the, at 11 to then 13 and meeting him and kind of like special attention and he's for framework for those of you that not listening you know or listening um you know satnam rasayan is very big all around the world and guru davison kind of took this like next level kind of uh, uh growth where he was very much like the had the the same persona as like Yogi Bhajan. It was kind of that next, that same persona with women around him and people who traveled with him and this level of like, it's it's what we're seeing in other, it's still very open and prominent today. And I'm bringing this out because it's somewhat what you're describing, like the level of specialness. And then he brings you to Mexico and New Mexico. Like now you're traveling with him and that's a special thing. It's not just you and him, you're in the entourage and then you're getting special moments with him. If Correct. I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah. Right. And can you give us so he awkward, big awkward in Europe, right? Like the, yeah. when he comes, it's kind of like big entourage and sure. Yeah, that same totally. energy that we saw with Yogi Bhajan, because I wasn't really involved in the Dharma around these years you're talking. So I just want you to, the listeners to get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very grateful for all the, you know, the information you're, you're enriching the story with, because these are all true, true things. And if I miss them, I, you know, I apologize. I'm really grateful for you to to complete where I'm lacking, you know. Because I'm just going through the storyline of what happened to me, but yeah. yes, you know, huh. there was this great, uh, luminous, charming facade that it, it is appealing if uh, you are a person with an open heart and 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 trusting that you know this could be something good. Then it's easy to to trip to 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 yeah. And your mom has a very close and significant relationship. She would be considered like the inner circle of his people at this time. Yes. Is that right? Yes, it, absolutely. So yeah. And Europe, also she is my mom. She's another important person guide in my life. So yeah. she believes him and all of her good friends believe him. And, you know, definitely she was a great supporter and 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 also i started to notice how many you know trips the two of them would take with with her in the facilities of being her assistant they would go to touring and and verona and i'm like come on are we all what the hell is it would just come on people <sighs> so um, i think it was shortly you know after that that's when I asked her so but do you think that he is really um 
loyal to his belief system and the kundalini of, of uh, I don't know do you think he's loyal to his wife and all of that and my mom goes yeah but of course what do you about absolutely yeah and I'm like oh great great yes slide to my face that's great just do that and and that's I'm sure that you are thinking this through as something being beneficial to me as I'm growing up mm. anyways just scratch that that was my inner dialogue back then and then there was a trip to to Egypt that I took with his wife and with with his daughter and son I believe we went on a cruise to Egypt and my mom and him remained in Campagnano Roma where they were taking care of his wife's mom that wasn't well at that time and uh and there I was like question question mark question mark question mark and then there was I think it was around the around the Raymond Raymond time, isn't it? In April, is that what it is? In uh, I don't remember. I've never Sorry. followed the Satnam Rasayan scene, okay. uh, but I do know that it got really big, and it is so. There yeah, was, was there was a um, a period in time where often uh, both Yogi Bhajans and Guru Dave Singh's entourage would travel to India because of a Raymond reunion, where all of these. Uh, spiritual leaders would join somewhere and i remember that right i think it was right before then we went to to india with his family and that was the shittiest awkwardest time that i've had along all of the other ones it's just like what why is he putting me in this sad, sad role of being his, uh, what, his affair while his wife is here, while his Narayan, the assistant, was here, and his children are here? What the fuck are we supposed to be doing? Going to the Golden Temple and cleaning? What are we, what are we cleaning? Oh, it's terrible. Anyway, sometimes I would have like um, private healing sessions with him and and then I remember that when we were in the hotel in Delhi everybody was waiting at the dinner table for us and he just kind of like took me and you know put me on my fours and and had sex with me right there and then like that in his hotel room where he slept with his wife and in one of his one of his kids and I was I, I did not have time to just say, no, back off. And then moments later, I had to sit down with everybody at the dinner table and put what kind of face on. I was feeling like the worst crap I've ever felt. And, and then after that, I, I think that things really started to crumble down. I was very reluctant to go to, to, to see him and meet him. There would be some phone calls, I believe. And then... I went kind of, I definitely at the time was very disturbed and unstable. I was using, you know, substances to, I don't know, probably not feel all of the great conflict and pain that I was experiencing. And I um, went, you know, my own way saw you know spent time with friends uh my mom i think sent me the the relationship with my mom had always been quite uh quite rough because of different reason reasons i was always feeling that i i don't really ever felt that my voice mattered even with her uh, former husband who now at this point was her ex-husband I had told her so many times I hate living with this guy I don't want to live with him but at the time she was like uh, he's like your dad you gotta accept it and you know I whatever I was bringing up wasn't even like acknowledged there wasn't like a time where we could have a conversation and my feelings would be validated mattered so i i kind of gave up on trying to relate nicely with her or relating at all with Gurudev. and but then at some point i 
in her I was getting out of control probably most likely I was giving her what hard time I could possibly give her um so she arranged that I would go and move to Rome at Campagnano at Guru Dave's house so to get things back in order so I was there for a little for like a few days and I started to look at the hell ahead of me and I was like Fuck no. Thank God I had a driver's license and my car with me. I one night just took off, left in the middle of the night. Goodbye, you all. My mom had already was even there visiting. I was like, fuck, I'm not doing this. I'm sorry. And I kind of cut all uh, all connection with Gurudev. With my mom, I couldn't because I still lived at her house. However, I was already being either, you know, sent for a time to live with her friends because for her it was really, I mean, that was always one of the strategies. When things were going into the shitter, she would just send us away, either me or my sisters. I've noticed that she's done that because she's not very, very, she, I don't know, she's not very capable of handle the intense conflict that, she's very much part of uh, you know she's she's part cause she's like 75% now, you, cause. you had already spoken to her directly to let her know that Guru Dave Singh had been not no yet, not yet not yet time. okay this, I was not at this time no I left so she's just wondering why you're going nuts is supposedly trying to save you by sending you to somebody out to his his place yeah to so, hell. so so yes I I spent a time I remember when I was um I think after that, I went to live with my grandma for a while so I could complete high school and, and at least get a degree because my schooling situation was disastrous. Ever so since- Time I mean, out. During this yeah. trip to India, everything you just described in terms of being with his wife and traveling, all that was still at like age 17. Uh, yes, between 17 and 18. Okay, uh, you turned 18, yeah. but you hadn't finished high school because you had gotten too uh, much. Yeah, stuff. I think that that, yeah, so that was all still, yeah, all the trips were still under, a, under the age 17. And then at 18, I needed to put something together. So I went to live at my grandma. It was a bit of a, more of a deep breath. We can do this. I can finish high school. I can get my driver's license. I think because I had my driver's license, sorry for the confusion in my in the, in the okay. time zone. I, I probably ended up at his house in, in the midst of, of me. I think it was right before I was turning 19. So it was at the end of, uh, um, of January in 2000. No, 1998, which is also when I moved to the ashram. I'm trying to put, put things in order, but it's hard because it's been a long time. So it was supposed to be a period where I would spend my time there and I refused. I think I was already graduated. So it was one of those, uh, what am I going to do with my life years? Okay. Um, I turned 19, 19, yes, in February. And then a few months pass by. And then in the beginning of, uh, of the summer, I, that's when I confronted my mom and asked her directly, uh, uh, so what about you and Gurudev? Because she still continued to go as a, an assistant to, his, to their trips to Verona and Turin. Mm, and I was like, well, with, he and I, we, he's teaching me advanced and number Zion. That's how she said it. I was like, uh, yeah, does the advance in number Zion also mean that you guys have intercourse? And she could not. She was like, did he put his penis into your vagina? And she said, yes. And I was like, OK, that's enough for me. Great. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to go and barf after burying myself back there. That's how I felt right after that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I didn't say any of it to her. I just, uh, I guess I was waiting for a response, but like she explains really well. And, and really, I love my mom. She is a character, but I love her with all my heart. 
she explains it really well in her story. She just like completely, you know, I can, I can totally see how her brain must have leaked out of herself. And what else do you do after that? When you find out that your, your own daughter has been abused by the same, by the same man that has abused you. So pause while well, at the moment you found out she was, she was having sex with him. And then you told her that you had been, that he had been having sex with you? Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, yes, yes. I also experience. told her, yes, because he has done the same with me. So definitely, oh my yeah. God. I apologize. I forgot that part of the story. I had, uh, <laughs> I had <laughs> given it there for her. Yeah, it was, I, I had to, you know, tell her this dude has been, you know, doing this in all of these occasions and this and that. I gave her some details and um, she must have probably felt like the worst shit in the world, like I was in that moment. We were sharing a great Salam Zion space there. <laughs> allow, you. allow, allow. Allow, uh, allow, right. Yeah. Um, pause, and I just yeah. want to give honor to your mother for writing her story. Brilliant, vulnerable, exposing, and only the beginning of, of so much more to share. But you're right, she really just had some amazing description in, in her shares. Yeah, I just read the following part and I'm like, wow, well, she's right. She writes really well. That's, I even get to laugh in the midst of this whole thing and pain. And Oh my gosh. So you're 19. You find out your mom had been having sex with him this whole time. He had been having sex, which we now, which as she framed, was predatory and abusive the whole time, but framed as special as well, framed right. as this unique only one as well, and lots of the same narratives, but didn't know it was happening to her own daughter, that she was basically sending as a counselor to this special man who had been, quote, helping her so much, knew all about your, your life and the family, like, wow. Okay, so you're 19, all this comes out, you're in full practice of allowing yeah so the best thing i could do was to go crazy for a little while so i did i mean not by choice <laughs> not by choice but so so my mom had to deal with her own process was not really present to to stay in doing any type of shared situation with me and i i did leave i left that day and then i packed my bags and went to visit a friend of mine in the south of Italy on a little island. And I kind of stopped eating, kind of stopped drinking, stopped uh, sleeping, drinking a lot and having some weed um, as often as possible to, I don't know, do what. And <clears throat> I stepped into a very, very psychotic space, like she says. To be honest, it felt great from from my part. I was, you know, it, it was a, a a space where I was hypersensitive to everything. Like my nervous system was so out of whack that I I felt myself sensing this and sensing that. And uh, now I can heal everybody. I'm the special one. That was that framing that he put in there biting me in the ass so badly I thought that I was some sort of like who knows what Whoa. I arrived down in the south of in the south of Italy where everybody has a very very particular mentality about certain things and after four days I ended up almost being stabbed to death so I quickly was helped by my friend that I was visiting to get back on a plane and back to my to my home and then my mom had to really just come down from her own you know tragic space and deal with me uh and then we went to the yoga festival and he was there and oh, I remember oh, yeah was the fact that you went to the yoga festival like this just blew my mind when i read this that your mom and you went to the yoga festival i necessarily he's like, wasn't but he's like a famous teacher there like he's the i was you know in any type of condition to make any rational choice for myself oh. i seriously tell you i was 
but also in a state of mind it was so crazy so crazy but also within the nature of quote our community you know i could see how that could be seen as the most healing place to be yeah sure. you know <laughs> so like if you think about it in that context and outside of that it, there's so many special things about going to any festival, much less one where there's chanting and this and, you know, yo, right. Yes. And right. Nostalgia where you're seeing right. people. So I'm just trying to like frame it back to like, why oh. would that have been a choice for you? My now, brain... now I am following you back. I thought I was somewhere else, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. For, for in, in the place where my mom was at that time for her was probably the the next best best choice for what some year was this it was 1998 98 yeah which was um yeah that's where i received the offer of going to live in in amsterdam and wait you go to the yoga festival your mom goes with you he's teaching there mm -hmm. Alice, yes go from there yes. yes okay so he's teaching there i remember actually you know having a like a, a a fallback in having you know in relating to him in that form in which we did before before i escaped from his house i was like in in that i mean i'm just gonna call it for what it was i was in a crazy space and within the crazy space there were not real clear lines so I remember one night going to his room and we we just slept there uh I remember uh I had my cycle so nothing happened we just kind of kissed and I slept next to him and then uh they follow I don't remember which day he offered for me to go and live in Amsterdam but I accepted at that time it wasn't the first time he suggested it but before I would always say no no I don't want to leave and that time I was like, well, sure, why not? Yes, um, uh, I had eaten probably a slice of lemon in the whole day. So, you know, I was just in, I was just cuckoo. And, but what to me was the craziest thing was that my mom was okay with that. My mom was okay with me going into the mouth of the wolf again. I, uh, you know, later on in the years where, when I was trying to digest and unpack everything, I started to realize how my mom had been a bit dangerous for me growing up. It was, it was dangerous for me to be so close to her. And so I also want to just pause and put a yeah. flag in the fact that you never had a space where you got to have boundaries. And you also didn't learn any. Oh, yeah. It had nothing to do with a psychotic state of yours. It was a yeah. long-term grooming process where boundaries weren't something that you ever got to learn and not something that was caused by your, your state of being. I mean, I think you were just in pure survival at this point. The fact that the very place that the predator, ha predator thing happened is the very place that it's nurturing Mm -hmm. is speaking to the formula of grooming yes and it's sure. what makes complex trauma so complex absolutely it's it's a lot of entang detangling right now for me but um i got to i got to be with it over these years things thankfully have kind of mellowed out in that sense so I got to see what were the dynamics and it feels like a, a, a mathematical equation growing up in Italy. And I looked at my childhood and adolescence afterwards. I mean, there never really was a time where the, there was good education or, or good uh, tools being passed on to me. Um, communication was, very limited and mostly conflictual so I avoided it I was not very well versed in the ways of uh, um, moving in a self-protective way in the world at all my dad was completely absent he would see me rarely and try to avoid taking care of me in a responsible way um, and never so he would Kind of give me lectures 
and then proceed to live his life in the total opposite way. So that, you know, did not take any type of route. I could not really trust what his words were. Um, my mom and, and her way of raising me were also, uh, well, I'm, unfortunately, I'm just going to describe it for how it felt for me. It always felt like she had something more important to do than being there to, uh, to care for what my needs were. It was, uh, you know, her, uh, she needed to develop her career in Kundalini Yoga as a teacher. She needed to, you know, take care of my sister. She needed to be with uh, her um, ex-husband. I always felt that I was going along in her life as um, not sure. I was her daughter. She loved me. There were times where when we were able to share affection and, and, and love, but I... More than that, I always felt that I needed to be doing chores, that I was there as a useful tool, you know, for her. Uh, when, you know, like even before she got divorced because of the, because of my stepdad trying to, I remember I would take care of my sister a lot as well. Um, I'm not sure um, her parenting isn't, how I, just because now I'm parenting my kids and I'm parenting in a, them in a certain way, I'm noticing how first she was very young. She was always trying to live her life and let me be taken care of by grandma or aunt or whatever. Uh, that was early stages. We did live together. So I'm sure that we did spend time together, but it was never my, my well-being and needs as the priority you know mm -hmm. and uh well maybe not never it there wasn't enough of it I feel for me to feel that I was nurtured safe protected cared for in a way that was consistent and stable I was always all over the place and I continued to feel that I wanted my mom all throughout my childhood you know there is still that little girl in there that's like, I want my mom, you know? And it's sad because I, you know, I am nurturing her through nurturing my daughters. I don't know. Maybe that's why I'm at this moment. <laughs> oh, God, I don't know. But uh, um, yeah, so there was no education. There was no self-protection strategies. Yeah, no, there was no. Example, yeah. And there were no boundaries it was no enmeshment and um, and constant violation of boundaries. And so what's yeah. so fascinating about what you're pointing out is that the teacher student dynamic with between your mom and Guru Dave Singh was violated, but then also the healer healer uh, recipient of healing dynamic is also violated. And then yeah. the spiritual seeker dynamic like all of that in one and then all of the brain planting you're talking about creates this mega confusing illusion and code that's feeding on actual information that he received about you early on because in that first relationship with your mom mm -hmm. she's disclosing family dynamics that relate to you and mm -hmm. your sister before you and her other relationships and her dad, her husband, like the level of complexity of violation and predation is so horrific. And we haven't even finished. Yeah. And I mean, we don't have to, if this is, it feels like we are at a, at a good place. We can. Yeah. Are you kidding? No, what I'm saying is yeah. you're bringing us to a point where mm -hmm. you and your mom speak it out loud. Mm-hmm. You both kind of like go into like, let's, let me go handle myself. When you do come back together, you go to the yoga festival, you both have handled your trauma states in whatever way. Nobody's talked about it outside of you two and Guru Dave Singh. And at yoga festival, there's still this energy that permeates because it's not energy that goes away. It's a complex, long history of groom level of nourishment and violation enmeshed into one. That is very well said. I could not have 
explained it better. Thank you. For and translating I'm framing it. that for listeners so that we can understand like, you know, the yoga festival is this landing place of like home and like, mm -hmm. let's figure out what's next and hear the all knowing teacher yet plants another seed of, Hey, why don't you go to the Amsterdam ashram and start working here? And I have to say out loud, one of my biggest happinesses, happy places of, of my community growing up is the fact that there is this global opportunity where when one's in a tough place in one area, there was a suggestion, hey, go live here, go work for that. There, that, that kind of fostered this deep longing to belong and to be a part of something with like a promise of the future that by building our family companies, our children would be provided for, our children will be taken care of. So mm. within that frame, before Olivia was in, this is a long history of that narrative. And yeah. here in 1996? Depend. I mean, that was 1998 when I was 98. Sorry, the summer of 98 at the yoga festival. This is very far in and that mystique, that energy of, wow, we're a global community, a family that loves you and you can go work, live in this other. So here Gurudev Singh setting her up to be at a place where she's protected. But again, mm. the predator is the one setting up this atmosphere. And as you're speaking, your mom, you're surprised, like, why would my mom let me do this? And it's like, again, she's in that hazy mystique of saying, maybe that is the best thing for her because mm -hmm. she feels collapsed and not knowing what to do within her own self. So bring us there. He suggests go to Amsterdam and you say yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I, I agree and I take off uh, with uh, Ari Jiwan, who was the head of the ashram at the time, or was, you know, mm, taking care of things with Guru Jagat Singh, uh, her husband. Mm, I remember in the car, there were three students coming directly from, uh, from India, from the Miripiri Academy. Um, and one of them was the person that I became, I became the wife of. Uh, we, we married a little, like a, a, the year after, less than a year after. Uh, we went to, we travel from France to Amsterdam in the car. And once we arrived, I settled into a room uh, at the Amsterdam ashram. Soon after they were readying the new building for the Yogi Tea Company. And I started to, I started to work there immediately, um, August, September, 1998. Uh, cleaning and cooking massages for people that needed it uh, and progressively the roles changed I became uh, uh, once the whole company was set up I became the secretary not the secretary the person that answers the phone I was a uh, you know the receptionist this uh, re the receptionist the person that would file and sort out mail and things like that uh i worked in the lab i i did all kinds of odd jobs um i unfortunately have to take a quick break because i hear my daughter waking up from now motherhood duty calls so we are back and you were describing to us um, that you had just, you know, went from the yoga festival to move to Amsterdam and worked in the ashram and several different um, companies and everything. But I, I just wanted to clarify very quickly, uh, was there ever any conversation or anything like Guru Dave, you and your mom talked about or like how to make sure to not talk about it in terms of the abuse and the situation that got revealed before you went to Amsterdam? Yes, absolutely none of that. Uh, the, the only, the only thing that we're talked about were much later on between my mom and I with uh, there were no you know addressing the situation there was no meeting uh, of what would have been required like uh, in an ideal situation you would respond to these type of events in a way of so what you know what had happened have conversations process elaborate unpack none of that had happened at that time. Uh, me and my mom would uh, seldomly 
refer in hinting ways in our conversations about what had happened. Um, with Guru Dev, I, I at that time never, I had never spoken with him about, you know, the abuse. He now took the role of my somewhat benefactor or protector uh, in Amsterdam. I never saw him. He, I, as I realize now, was the one that was basically um, funding my life over there at first until I started to work and, and generate some income for myself. Um, he occasionally we would talk over the phone and and tell me that he would support me energetically if I would open the space, you know, in Satnamar's eye and terms, if you open this space, which is, you know, everywhere, um, he would be there to to support me in whatever way I needed. I maybe initially i because it was such a, a new he was a point of reference for me that was such a new reality it was an exact i was in in my right state of mind when i made the choice to accept to go there so i felt myself quite lost initially mm, and out of place a bit awkward at times it wasn't my comfort zone, my type of reality, what I would choose for myself. I kind of was going along with the program. Uh, and at the same time, though, there were good things happening. I met a good group of friends, very dear to my heart. And I was happy to be able to spend time with them. The life at the ashram was for me something that yes was existing i i was living there but i was also trying to escape those rules those were not resonating with me i don't think i ever ever in my life felt that the the strict uh, what i called hybrid sick seek rules were any in any way resonating with me and who i am in fact, yeah, I'm I'm sure that was the reason why our the the marriage between me and um, uh, and my ex husband arrived so prematurely, and it was because uh, we were not really respectful of the rule, uh, you know, no no sex before marriage. So as soon as you know the word got to the to Yogi Bhajan, mm. uh, it was. A, a cause to to resolve the ma this matter right away. These two need to be married as soon as possible. In fact, that's what happened on a trip that we took to Rome uh, at Guru Dev's house. He lived in Campagnano. There was a big uh, gathering with Yogi Baja and all his entourage, and every everyone that was uh, a Yogi Baja and Guru Dev follower came to visit one day and. And people were having, um, audience. Could you say audiences with him? No, they wouldn't. They would be seen by him, and uh, like a like a like a one on one, but a bunch of people in the room witnessing it, similar to the way Yogi Budget. Correct. Right. Yes. And yes. So Yogi yes. Budget would come to these events, or was this just a Yogi Guru Dave Singh? You're saying Yogi Budget. He was just visiting. He was just visiting Rome at that time before going to Hamburg. I believe, and and um, my he was my boyfriend at the time, and I went to visit, and and on that occasion particularly, we went to say hi to him, and and I remember that he just completely pinned me there in front of him, screaming to me that I had to ask him, my boyfriend, to. You know, I had to ask him to marry me. Uh, and I, I was just, uh, once again, it was one of those moments of shock because the whole thing started where he was at least at, at first friendly, you know, Yogi Bhajan was. Mm. Oh, uh, and why are you guys, why aren't you two married? And I was like, well, I was actually waiting for him to ask me. I was just popping out the very first, because I was very nervous. I popped out the very first answer that came to my head in that moment. 
such pressure of all the people there. And I remember my mom and my sister on my right side and uh, and and Ben he was like, he's never going to ask you to marry you, to marry him. He was like in that shrieky voice, very annoying. And then he was like, uh, you ask him, ask him right now. And he had to say that quite a few times before I was able to dislodge and, and do that. But I was not super proud of myself. I felt that it was so extorted from me. I felt completely like forced in a violent way so unnecessary too uh, I and then everybody around the expectation I could like it was palpable everybody like come on ask him ask him ask him hmm. I'm sure that that had a lot to do of uh, the uh, you know it was one of the main causes of several dysfunctions in my marriage throughout the whole entire length of it with with my ex unfortunately <laughs> which that again you know was was sad because oftentimes I tried to to communicate that particular sensation that particular experience I had with my ex-husband and he never validated it he always was making me feel bad almost he was like I never regretted any of that I never felt like it it wasn't hearing that in that moment that I went through something that was painful and shocking and and violent and traumatizing. Huh? And yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what he was hearing was me complaining about something that to him wasn't to be complained about because the way it was raised was you just listen to the to the serious inside. You know, his parents always um, were so, so devoted in that sort of, I'm just going to say fanatic, non, non-critical uh, non thinking, non -critical way. thinking way. Yeah. I want to put a pause here and just say that you're jumping into like a pattern that you discovered in your marriage because he was raised in 3HO of how um, that cattle, this moment where, you know, you felt like you had this palpable dramatic experience of being told to be married. And what he did back to you is a form of gaslighting. And that's a very regular normative thing in our culture, right? So here he's like, well, no, I didn't feel that like, and then make you feel bad that, that you had an experience that might've been different from his own. And I don't know him, but I want to point out that that's learned. We all learned mm -hmm. that growing up. If we witness getting gaslit, we weren't allowed to feel anything and we're constantly being made to feel responsible for anything we are noticing that seems abnormal. We're constantly being made to be crazy for what's happening in real time. Yeah, that's, yeah, unfortunately so sad. But yeah, it's true. We do learn by imitation of what our surroundings offers us. The forming years are where the imprint takes pl takes place. So yeah. Uh, I also yeah. want to pause here and just say, because you brought up this incident with Yogi Bhajan, you know, telling you to get married or to f ask him your boyfriend who just because you're sleeping together, they make it a big scene that you need to make sure you get married. Um, before that, had there been any, uh, had you known of any um, communication towards Yogi Bhajan about what happened with you and Guru Dave or your mom and Guru Dave. Do you know if any of that, or at this point, you have no idea if Yogi Bhajan knows at all? Well, the only the only moment in which I I thought he might have known was right on on that uh, trip that Guru Dave took me to to Española, right after the first abuse. He was, he, he was very stressed one day doing this med meditation to clean his aura because he knew Yogi Bhajan could see everything. He could read everything in his aura. So he was like, cleaning, cleaning. I'm going to do this for you too. Don't worry. And he was just cleaning. And then we went to meet him. And I remember probably massaging Yogi Bhajan's uh, feet. But it doesn't matter. I do know that 
very soon after starting date starting uh the yeah dating with the, my ex-husband I we, before we were married just very soon after starting dating I did tell him that I had been abused by Gurudev and even then it was nothing that came off it I he I don't think he ever ever really said anything Whoa. as far as I remember I I I, it was uh, me speaking into the empty space. And I mean, I'm sure that he registered something. But even after we were married, when I would bring up the pain or need, when I needed to speak about this, because specifically we were living at his, at his parents' house and they would host Gurudev there. And I also was, I mean, I, I was, I was under that same roof and I did not want to be there. I would voice my, my, well, outrage. I was very angry and I constantly would be shut down as a, as a whiny bitch and that I was ungrateful. So it was tough. It was very tough, you know, for me to, so you're describing years later when you're living with your husband, you have your children and you're living under the roof of your husband's, your ex-husband's parents who are all in 3HO, was raised in the Dharma. Guru, they host Guru Dave Singh and shut your voice down around not wanting that to happen. They knew what you had communicated or you had only communicated to your ex-husband about the abuse. Oh, no, they were, they were well informed before... My husband, my ex-husband and I got married. My mom made sure to, to tell um, his, his mom about it. At least his mom knew. And I'm pretty sure she shared with her husband. And then I wasn't aware of that until years later. And also me, I personally had to share with her that that had happened. And I remember that the yeah she was very upset at me for causing for for causing disruption while he was there for being pissed at her basically for continuing to host him there after i told her and she's she said she would speak to her husband and her husband said he's a different person now, which wasn't true because, you know, maybe six months later, we heard, uh, you know, rumors of uh, an 18 year old girl at the yoga festival in France, you know, reporting him. It was no longer in Loche, it was in the other, in the new location, but so he wasn't really, he hadn't really changed. But they continued to support him and not once did they ask me if I needed anything, if I was okay, or nothing. It, she was just really angry at me because it was inconvenient that I was speaking out my my rage, discontent, my pain, my, and you know. Well, that the predator, the violator that abused you is coming to live in the house that you live and how unsafe that feels. And it's just- yeah. It's also a repeat of what you've already spoken, that your voice never mattered and what you needed never mattered. It's just this like repeating, like on repeat. I know you jumped right to this story, which is really yeah, important yeah. um, because it really is speaking to decades later in like years later in your marriage, how this is circulating in the United States, now not in Europe, but in the United States, because you're married to someone who grew up in 3HO. And even though he had heard about your abuse, some level hadn't registered on him go back to the point that so yogi bhajan tells you to marry but then guru dave singh marries you yes it was uh that that i feel it was a short circuit in my head i i just let that happen but that was because i remember when we when uh, we traveled to hamburg uh it was Shortly after uh, I started dating my ex-husband, there was uh, another meeting with Yogi Bhajan in Hamburg and Gurudev was there and he told me, he 
said to me, oh, this is a really, this is a really nice guy. What a, what, que lindo este muchacho. Un día los voy a casar. One day I'm going to marry you guys. And I feel that I was still very, very susceptible to his command kind of I all I for the longest time I continue to have this uh I guess I I almost felt that it he was mind controlling me you know in whatever way he was doing it I and I was allowing it and I felt like the worst guilt and shame for that for not being able to control it you know speak up and and but also there was like a whole surrounding of people around me that that also weren't saying anything I at some point started to almost believe that I was the crazy one you know that I was the one in the wrong and and that I you know that maybe it was true that I was an inconvenience that I was I felt so guilty you know for so many things uh I it yeah, the, the, I was. Those were difficult, really difficult feelings to go through and digest for myself. And re, I don't know, release. Don't. I don't even know how to say it. It's just normally I remember going into therapy years later, and you know, guilt and shame normally block the natural flow of you know anger or rage or those are all healthier expressions of our immediate you know response to search certain situations but if there if there is guilt and shame put there then those feelings are no longer allowed to flow naturally yeah i mean there are safe ways to express all of those ones you know but not, Even with just the, like, yeah. not with the training you're describing, right? No, absolutely. I, I mean, yeah, it was definitely not not welcome to to speak uncomfortable truths. I want to pause there, Olivia, and just speak to what it means as a 16, 17-year-old being to be abused and groomed in this way and then at 19 to speak out loud to it and to have nobody actually do anything. And I just mm -hmm. want to pause and feel that. Yeah, because thank you. The community is responsible and there are people that were in leadership and are in leadership in Europe that are responsible and including him and the people around him and your mom and all of the circumstances and the people who received you in Amsterdam and every the ethos of our community breeds silence and it breeds that message that your voice doesn't matter and it's your fault and so the the compounding interest of that from that 16 year old experience where what you thought trust that m morphed and mutated into this predatory experience where he was also a caretaker and then have the community use silence as a way to keep that breeding and then decades later it's showing up again this is the formula that keeps perpetuating and it's still happening present day and it's through silencing us that this continues because silencing is a predator's tool. Yeah. And I am glad that everyone is finding their, those of us that have come forth to speak all of our stories out loud I am grateful for because this is the work, the first step into continuing the healing work for all of us. This is how we can we can identify and and recognize these patterns so that we can choose away from them, choose something different. There is a different response that 
we can bring into the play. I also want to add that, you know, it, the more is it out in the open, the more is seen as it occurs in, in that moment. And whoever tries to use that predator formula will not have the power to hook us into it anymore. Right. And the more we come together, the more we amplify this type of frequency, this type of vibration, this type of, well, I am going to not choose this. I'm going to create my own, my own choice, my own, what I want to say is, Sorry, it gets confusing within this, but you know, it is what we are supposed to be doing. We need to be coming together. We need to bring all the light possible on. I'm getting lost on the this. The darkest time. shadows of all of our collective experience. We need to yeah. shine the light and keep shining the light. And that means speaking some of the hardest most manipulative experiences with healers, community members, family members, people that we love and we don't want to disrupt their lives. And yet our stories are a part of how we speak real truth into these really dark and manipulative forces that have infiltrated our community for decades. And I infiltrated isn't the right word because why be instigated and, and planted these formulas early on and it continues to perpetuate through the teachings and the formulas of 3HO not addressing mm -hmm. what is in plain sight. Yes, yes, yes. And Very I have much. been connected to the larger story of all how Satnam Rasayan has grown and how all the different yatras and teachers have grown. But I know that these hierarchies still very much exist, that these levels of notoriety and pro uh, prominence, the closer you are to these special teachers and the manipulative formula that you're painting around your special, we've known each other in past lives. This, this is not a narrative. This is a narrative that many healers, wise men, teachers, are using within this context of the yoga of awareness and special knowledge that's supposed to help people transition into the new Aquarian age. And it's only by us naming this stuff and speaking to it that somebody else realizes, oh, I don't have to get caught in that web. That happened to me too. And her and her and her and him and him and him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hope that at some point, uh will have the opportunity to to build new new systems new structures for ourselves so that we can continue to to interact with each other in a way that's healthy without all of this uh murky secrecy anymore it you know just a, a clean authentic you know, true way of being with each other. I mean, this is already true and authentic. And this is, you know, basically it's, <laughs> it's going to really dig into the manure, hopefully to go and fertilize a better garden or, you know, to choose what gets to, to fertilize the new soil. We need to really do big, big work for that. We got some collective compost to work. I know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm just blown away. Like here again, the silencing, the kind of the uh, the expectation, the kind of the group atmosphere is kind of moving you along into like letting the predator become the person who marries you. Yogi Bhajan's kind of putting this along you're not sure if he knew about your abuse or not because nobody's talking about this yeah no I at that point I don't I didn't know I just found out I just found out with my mom's story that she had told Yogi Bhajan in 1999 
uh, at the solstice when Gurudev married us. Uh, I didn't know before. Yes, me and my mom have a few things we probably should be continuing to talk about. Wow. Um, she has always been one to, you know, that paradigm of uh, the, the parents being, you know, like so much in my head rings this old formula you know you're not supposed to be your your child's friend and that's how she raised me you know and that is something that I I completely discarded in the relationship with my kids in the relationship with my kids I'm like well first of all how how silly is it? Why wouldn't you want to what? Do you want to be the enemy of your own child? Why would you bring it even into this world? And what kind of a why? So I I did recognize that she was very much raising me by that formula, where she wouldn't involve me into you know certain particular processes in her life that would have been super helpful for me, you know, in in growing up, but also especially after something as violating as this and as intertwining as your experience yeah. was, you would think that a line of communication opened, but again, we'll save her story for her to share, yes, but sure. in her story, she does speak to her process of like her own discombobulation and why, why she kind of let her daughter just kind of do what was next in her journey. And again, we'll let that be her own story. Yeah. 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 She did speak to, um, that she told Yogi Bhajan in 1999. So again, you know, his response is something that's written in her, her stuff. And you carry on, you get married, end up moving to the United States. And as you described years later, Gurudev Singh ends up coming and being hosted by your parents-in-law. And are there other things you want to share about your married time and, and just things that started unraveling in you since, since that incident? So one, well, I would backtrack just very quickly to say that um, it, I wasn't really willing to move the United to the United States. For me, it it became more of a almost. So we were evaluating our choices at the time of deciding that we wanted to move out of Amsterdam. I certainly wasn't ready to go back to Italy, and I said that I would consider moving to the States in San Diego where his family lived as long as we would we would for under no circumstances live under his parents roof I did not want to go to the States and live with them and also I didn't want to burn through our savings because for me those would have been like a way out in case it didn't work out for me to live there but uh, as we and and you know one of the reasons why we decided that it was okay to go was because also his parents had offered for us to live in one of the apartments they owned and also that there would be possibly a job, you know, like most certainly a job for me at the home daycare. His mom was, um, well, she owned and managed. And uh, well, when we arrived there, everything crushed down. It was just none, none of that really happened. So basic, basically, we arrived and there was no apartment. The one that they had promised us, it was already rented to somebody else. Uh, and then uh, the... Okay, and uh, so... Press the wrong button. Okay, keep going. Cool. So obviously since... Um, the living situation we expected was was not there. We ended up living at his parents and uh, it was supposed to be a temporary period that lasted for a couple of years. Uh, and to this day, I continue to describe that as the worst years of my life. <laughs> There's been some tough times even after that, but those, I have to say, they were so just so against my desires and, and will. I... I was very depressed, very, very depressed. 
and also because um, when I would again try to speak about it with my with my ex, uh, I wouldn't really be considered. That would was not you know was not what was important. We were there, and I should have been grateful that we had a roof on our head. And I you know in certain ways, obviously I was you know I was not on the streets, but I was very unhappy. There was no support that I was receiving from anywhere. I continuously felt that I was living in a hostile territory, that I was not really, not really welcome. Maybe there were times in which, you know, we bonded as a family and, but the, the underlaying soil, the underlaying general feeling that I continued to live in was that of, uh, I don't want to be here. I feel very upset that none of the things I said were important to me had happened. Obviously, at first, uh, we we really didn't have a job, so we did burn through all our savings. And also, we had a second daughter. Um, our second daughter was born there. Um, I remember my pregnancy being very sad. I was very depressed. And I feel bad for my daughter having to live through that with me. Um, I remember often again being called ungrateful and um, and and whiny because I was seeking my discontent. I don't think that there ever really was um, you know a soul and uh, you know a someone that would be interested in listening to me. I I felt really angry about being, you know, being promised uh, all of these things only just to, you know, get us to go there. I know that those that I think it was in my opinion it was more his mom. He she wanted what she wanted. She wanted her son back and she wanted to see her her grandchildren grow up and so she said what she had to say she manipulated the situation as much as she could to get what she wanted it was uh i mean i i still carry a lot of grief because of that that's, a, that's for sure what I can say. I remember also, you know, speaking directly with her uh, about how I was feeling. And it was mostly re in relation to the, the, the Guru Dev instance, the fact that, you know, she didn't like having to walk on eggshells in her own home because I was pissed. And she came to me to talk about it. And I was like, but you know what happened between, you know, you know what he did to me. What if he did that to your daughter? What would you have done? Well, yeah, definitely. If he had done that to my daughter, things would be different. I was like, oh, great. So yeah, that makes me feel much better now. So basically, you're not my daughter. It's not different. Yeah, I never really necessarily felt that she was fond of me. I felt that I was an interference between what she wanted for her son you know, and, and what actually was happening. Wow. I cannot speak for her though. I can only just give what my, my inner feelings were whenever I would be in relationship with her. And, and was there like um, a Rancho San Diego community that you were part of, or was it just under their household? And it was mostly under their household. Um, yeah, I, I never really fully adopted the, the the lifestyle with with the full you know with the fullness of it. I I continued to do yoga and I continued to do uh, meditation. Those were comforting still at times. I have well now it's been a long time since I've done it. I've done other kinds of 
but just at that time you're you're not necessarily wearing a turban and you're doing whatever you want in terms of like you're eating and stuff like that or under this household you're living a vegetarian life or definitely vegetarian life i continue to live a vegetarian life after, until I, um until after yeah until i moved out until i was divorced and moved out on my own uh I yeah. in terms of like the seeking way of life, even though we know now that the 3HO adaptation is just really cultural appropriation, but in 3HO language, it's like, are you practicing in the Dharma? Like, are you living, are you going to Gurdwar? Are you wearing a turban? Are you not cutting your hair? Like I wasn't cutting my hair. I wasn't eating meat. I was participating to Gurdwaras. I sometimes would go to Sadhana at their house. I mean, we lived there and they had it and and were they like um, the beds where people came to their house for sadhana and like did yoga teacher trainings and stuff like that? So yes, yes, yes. They yes, were a major of hub of a network of 3HO trainings and, and sadhana Rasayan trainings are kind of like for people to come in and visit. Yes. And also just a, a couple of years back, they opened up a Kundalini Yoga Center uh, stopped by Yogi Bhajan here in the city. And uh, that was their primary occupation after they close down the home daycare. Got it. So during this time, um, when things aren't so going so good, um, did you have communication with Guru Dev Singh or with Yogi Bhajan? No. So once you moved to the US, that just kind of, you got married and that stopped? No, in all honesty, I do remember once when Guru Dev was visiting. Most of the time, I, most of the times I would always avoid uh, being in the house, being at the house, I never saw him. I just knew that he was receiving patients, clients. He was he was teaching and stuff. And only once I did go to say hi to him uh, when he was there. And I don't know what came, what why, what possessed me to go. Just you know something random, one of those old patternings just kicking in. Yeah, you know, so that was it. Once again, I, I wanted to speak to how hard it is to watch your abuser be publicly painted as a saint over and over and over. And it reminds me of like Alan versus Pharaoh of like what it's like to be a daughter that has been abused and then to watch your abuser, you know, be painted. And, you know, you're speaking to an inner world and an inner lack of validation of your being that is reinforced over and over again and supposedly from one of the most enlightened spiritual communities you know under the guise of yoga of awareness or satna rasayan or whatever these fancy mystical manipulative formulas are yeah. i really want to speak to the hardness of that like what made you go talk to him well He's being painted and brought around and fawned on. And people are fawning. And what made people stay in silence for 50 years while being abused by YB? You know, same thing. It's like, it's like, I don't know. I'm just, want, again, I'm, I'm pausing for that reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I like these pauses. They honor. They honor a really interesting place that I just want to forgive myself for. I have to do that work over and over and over. Yeah. As they come up and I think, oh yeah, I already forgave myself. I, uh, no, <laughs> here it is. It's here again. <sighs> okay, well, so these are most of the events I, I i don't know what else if we want to continue i'm you know well what happened so the, you're giving us a picture into the marriage and the relationship with the family you felt like wow things aren't at all good um how much longer does that go until like tell us about your story outward or however it goes on until you start choosing other things yeah well i mean i definitely did not have proper communication tools to to really take care of the dysfunctions that were going on in my marriage and i definitely in several ways acted out 
the in in disruptive ways for myself and for the relationship. Um, well, I'm hoping you are getting in touch with your rage and your anger. Yes, yes. Uh, I, you know, not really being able to, to to get across or to get my word being heard and validated. I did not know what else to do. I kind of, you know, at times started to go off and do my own thing. Uh, but necess not necessarily in in a in a in a healthy way. Definitely, it, I felt that I was falling back into my coping mechanism, past coping mechanism of you know drinking alcohol or uh, going out, and I for sure at that point was not able to feel a connection that was healthy in the relationship with my ex-husband. Um, so there definitely was a good period of feeling hurt and hurting, not intentionally to hurt him, but just because I didn't want to be there. I didn't know what to do. I also did not feel like I had the tools to, to make myself uh, build up a new life I was I for the longest time was um the one raising the kids while he would be going to work first he got a degree um so I'd stay with the kids while he was going to school and I stayed with the kids when he started working and then we moved out finally of his parents house we had a little bit of uh you know uh, uh, we had a good moment there uh, and then the, the root issues in our relationship kind of brought everything to collapse. Um, I, I admit I did not behave like the best person. If I could go back and do it all over, I, there are so many things I would do differently in ways of being more communicative, more assertive, more respectful. And I feel really bad for hurting him. I know I did. Um, I, and at, you know, at some point in 2009, um, he decided that he was hurting too much and that he wanted to separate. And I, I honor him for that. It, it must have taken him a lot of courage. Um, I'm sure he also comes from his own traumas, whether they are worked on, acknowledged or not. I could feel that at times he was coming from a place of pain in relating with me too. So, but we decided to divorce, uh, well, first separate, and then we began divorcing and it was finalized in September, 2010. Um, for a year, he went back to live with his parents. I remained in the house we were living in with the girls. We were sharing custody. Um, and then I started to go to school, to massage school, so I could, you know, be self-sufficient. I did some other odd jobs in various restaurants. I, I was trying to, when the girls were with him, to maximize my, you know, work work time i was trying to bring in the income necessary to to make ends meet here in san diego it's a really expensive city so being a single parent in my situation where there was no real i was alone there i didn't have a support system like he did mm -hmm. so i had to figure it out for myself initially he was very helpful and his mom was helpful here and there too and but then once i moved out Oh yeah, there was a moment where we tried to, where we tried again to make things work, also disastrous. So we finally decided that it was time for me to leave the house at that point. He, so he went back to to live in the house where we were living together, and I moved out to um, a different area of the city near the schools of the girls, just to make it make it practical 
and after that i began just uh i guess building my life according to me just me how i wanted things there was my mom was far enough he was far my ex-husband was far enough his family was far enough i could just put what i wanted in that space and and the the way we lived was according to not my rule but my preferences finally so for me those were our my my golden years you know it was fantastic i was doing massage i was learning many more things i continued to to, to cultivate my hobbies um i would be able to be full time with the girls when they were with me so i was kind of carving my schedule around their schedule it was working out there was some sort of good uh, good thing going there good balance um yeah my girls also yeah and my girls also referred to that time as uh, one of their their favorite times we always would sit down at the round table and do art together we there was a lot of cooking and music and coloring it was like art art a bunch and heart a bunch and yeah it was good that was good i don't think that i would interact much with uh no ah well yes i did i did try for quite a while to mend my relationship with his mom and with with him just you know i don't know but just just by being open hearted and do the best i could to well, to be a good person in, you know, towards him. I was feeling really guilty for all of my, my acting out, you know? Yeah. So I want to also, yes. real quick, because I, I do want to say how, how you're, you're doing a beautiful job at owning um, your, uh, for lack of a better real understanding, maybe it was volatile expression, maybe it was yelling, maybe it was uh, abusive to him, whatever. I don't know if it got physical or if you were just yelling. My point is, is that it sounds like you got to a point where you blew your own lid because you had been tired of being told you're crazy all this time. And that fits in to the exact formula of emotion commotion. Mm -hmm. the crazy woman and mm -hmm. all of the teachings that kind of were the grace of God women teachings disguised as as this way to subjugate the voice of the woman and the matter of the woman meanwhile men are getting this other formula of being this masterful healer the more women I have sex with the more I'm helping them evolve their karma and I'm bringing this up because my dad operated through that he also was one of those healer director ashram types that slept with lots of yoga students and lots of other people did too it's not new and the level of prominence and bigness this happened and then the silencing of it and then how you got kind of just morphed into marriage life and then again silencing and then again shame and this guilt and shame internally blocking the natural flow of your emotions as you talked about and then here it's violently coming out right the expression of withheld feeling it wasn't it wasn't necessarily in those terms i was just dismissing the the relationship i just didn't want to be around them i wasn't really blasting out with him sometimes some of the frustration would come out like that with the kid which it reminded me so much of my mom while i was growing up and how she would blast on me but my kids are i don't know they're special I remember my little one once being so little and me being so pissed, you know, I was, I had just blew out on the oldest probably because they weren't getting ready for bed fast enough. And finally I just went to wash the dishes. I was like, and I was like this, and my little one at the time, she was maybe two, Mariluna, she pulled my pants and I look at, their, at her and I go in front of her, she takes my face into her hands, looks straight into my eyes and tells me, mom, can I come into your life? And when she said that, 
I completely melted. I completely melted. She, that was one of the beginning stage, uh, stages of my own deepest healing. I started to realize there that I had to do big work. She's I just heard you say that you started recognizing your trauma patterns by the way that you would lash out at your children. Yes, there were like a couple of years at the beginning. Obviously, it's really stressful, stressful to be a parent of three and, yeah. you know, having a lot of uh, a lot of responsibility that also, once again, were not necessarily recognized. I always felt that <laughs> my ex felt that I was just at home not doing anything. But mm. there were, you know, <laughs> anyways, in that moment, I, I just took it in that, well, I needed to rectify big time my personal value system. I needed to rearrange my whole life. That was the beginning of one small revolution after the next. Mm. I told her, yes, you can come into my life. We mm. hugged and she was del delicious. And, mm -hmm. and then I went back to to wash my dishes and I uh, I was I was not even sure of who I was anymore at that point but my kids helped me so much in so many occasions you know that was a very powerful one there were many other powerful ones uh, but I feel that the acting out was more you know wanting to generate some some good situations for myself that were outside of the house, so friendships. And I have to be honest, uh, I, I felt that I had, you know, I needed something that could nourish me because I was just starving for, for some, I don't know, some food, some, something that could make me feel good. Real connection, real honest, honest exchange. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I don't want to go into those details, perhaps, you know, okay. another time. All I was pointing out was that the circumstances that brought you to this place to choose whatever you needed to do next, whether yeah. it was whatever it was that led to breaking up the marriage, um, all of that, just being in an atmosphere where you're constantly silenced and made to believe you're crazy for feeling the way you feel brings us to a point of quote craziness, which yeah. only perpetuates the cycle back to the teachings that say emotion, promotion, mm. la, la 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 la, it is your fault. It's only feeding that same story. That's all yeah. I'm pointing out. And we also know that victim, victimized people can turn into victimizing others if we're not processing our own pain. And that can come through verbal abuse, it can come through emotional abuse, it can come through physical, sexual, as we know. So any of us that don't heal, this can then show up in ways that we then violate those that we love unconsciously yeah. or unconsciously. And that you can do, I can do, every one of us can do. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I completely, I, I agree with that. I do, I, I did see that in, in my home behavior at that time. I was certainly, you know, reckless. And My I, not in completely destructive way, just, yeah. And I just want to commend you for letting just, your you daughter know. become your teacher, you know, in that moment, like, it's like a moment of being woken up out of our own stupor to say, yes, this is yes. the beginning of that unravel, which it sounded like. Yeah. For you. yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, astounding. Um, <sighs> we covered so much. <laughs> this was, this is a great... <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, just ask as we are nearing the end, if there's any aspect or any part that you feel like you need to revisit or share um, or, or wrap up towards. I don't have anything immediately coming up or flashing in this moment. I can't, unless you do, I don't feel. What I will ask is, um, I first read the story of your mother putting this and then you had reached out to me and um, 
what is the nature of your relationship? Obviously, you two have done work, or you wouldn't, you, she wouldn't even be able to write in this capacity, and you've done a lot of work on yourself, so I'm assuming you've done work with each other. Is there anything you want to just let us know in terms of that, where your connection is now? and With my mom? Yeah. Yes. Um, my mom and I speak regularly, and we definitely have a a love as a foundation that is allowing us to weather through so much there are many parts that have yet to that have yet to be elaborated possibly together we did in fact do a lot of work individually and at times we have come to speak about our own inner intimate experience as far as, as this goes. And I have held her accountable for what I felt was a lack from her part in relation to me. And she owned up bravely to all of it. And uh, she has apologized, which was what I needed. You know, it's, you know, what I feel when there is something that goes in such traumatic realm that would be one of the forms in which we heal it where both parts come back to me and resolve it with a deep heartfelt apology I have never received that from Gurude, for instance even though over the years I've tried to elaborate that with him personally too but it didn't it didn't occur um I'm grateful that it is happening with my mom. I I know that occasionally there is resentment and there is anger bubbling up, but I can always, you know, she's a safe place for me to express that now. And I would be able to, I mean, I, I, I she has never really expressed any type of rage or anger or or any of that to me in relation to this story particularly. I don't think she could. I don't think it's her place, but she understands that as well. So for me, I feel that somehow doing this together has helped us both heal little by little mm -hmm. our trauma. Yeah. I'm grateful for our relationship. I'm really grateful for your honesty here and your courage to speak this story, your story, and the complexity of this story and that set number sign continues to grow worldwide. Mm. And we're talking about a teacher who's currently active as opposed to when we tell stories about YB. Yeah. He is past. And um, I speak this very clearly, um, and I feel like it's such an important point to note that when all of these stories started coming out in 2020, one of the main responses I received and witnessed from the European mm -hmm. community was kind of this, this easy pivot that just said, oh yeah, Yogi Bhajan wasn't so much influencing us. We're, we're all the way over here. And I was quite disgusted. Like I could feel like this inner slime that kind of took over me on the inside for students to actually believe that of their own experience completely eludes the reality mm. of how those teachings propagated and how mm. the formula continued to carry on with prominent teachers in that space and continues today. Yeah. Well, hopefully the more we tell stories, the more students will become aware and perhaps uh, make the make more informed choices that's right all the way over in mexico and in europe and in latin america and all over the world that that within the the bedrock is the foundation of predatory um, operating systems that we have to be willing to start dissecting and shedding light on because it's not enough to say take his picture out and take his name out because the predatory formula continues to propagate and these stories, yeah. your story, your courage to share today really gives us a lens into that current day reality within our Well, 
Thank you, Kurunishan, for listening to my story and for the work that you're doing with all of us. It's uh, an incredible gift of your time and your energy. And I really appreciated the interaction that there was during this uh, conversation we had. It was great to be with you here. Thank you. <laughs> it was so great to be with you here as well. And it just, it means so much for you to um, give us this this perspective here. It's it's really important. And, um, and I also know how vulnerable that this is. So again, thank you. Um, and I honor you, I honor your family and your choice to change your parenting and your, your relationship to your children in very tangible and specific ways. And I honor you and your mom's willingness to heal with each other, um, no matter who wants to keep the silence. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so tell us about your song. I would like to wrap up by uh, hearing your song. Yeah. Um, are we going to listen to it together or do I just tell you I will? Yeah. Well, it's intro a... it. And then what we're going to do is just listen to a little blurb of it. Like, um, not enough, but just a little bit. And if you want to hear the whole song, you can actually hear the Uncomfortable Conversations playlist that's on Spotify. And the link is in the description of the podcast. So I hear that song often because I really love it. Um, I somehow related to a soul's journey into incarnating here. I have no clue of what Eddie Vedder um, has he wrote it if he was the one writing it if he intended it that way but that's how it speaks to me it speaks of the journey of learning and absorbing the richness of the experiences as we live through the path that our life carves for us or that we carve carve for ourselves mm. and During what's life? the name of the name of the song and the name of the artist the name of the song is uh, no ceiling by eddie vedder if i pronounce it correctly all right, and here we go. Let's listen to Eddie Vedder. And that is No Ceiling by Eddie Vedder. Thank you so much. Again, you can listen to the full song at the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast uh, playlist on Spotify. This has been another episode of the Uncomfortable Conversations play, uh, podcast, the untold stories of the Kundalini Yoga 3HO community. Um, if you would like to donate to this podcast you are welcome to donate a monthly or one-time donation at gurunishan.com slash uncomfortable conversations if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast please send me an email to gn at gurunishan.com you can also follow my work at gurunishan.com thank you again for tuning in please share this episode with someone you know from our community worldwide thank you again olivia for your courageous share today and we'll talk to you Thank in the you, next Thank you, Gurunishan.